Recorded at the studios of Chicago Public Media, WBEZ, this is Stages to Success. The drive to excel is universal, as is the pride in a job well done. Whether you're staring down a decision maker for a multi-million dollar contract, a television camera or microphone, a negotiating adversary, or an irate conductor, the pressure to perform can be exhilarating and exhausting. Join me and meet great storytellers from music and business. In April of 1992, an undetermined source of a flood started to come through the older buildings in the Chicago Loop. It took a few days, even weeks, to discover the amount of total damage, which ran into the billions of dollars. Today's guest to talk about the origins and the system that allowed that flood to occur is Bruce Moffat. He's not a worldwide famous engineer, He's not an expert in the economy of tunnels and tunnel delivery, but what he is is a lifetime hobbyist who became interested in the underground tunnel system that connected the buildings of downtown Chicago, begun in the 1880s and continued into the 50s. Bruce wrote a book 10 years before the disaster that talked about the origins of the system and how it worked. And then 10 years after, the flood, he wrote another book that we discuss in some detail today with the idea of starting to understand what happens when infrastructure is ignored and left to be a source for later problems. Bruce Moffat is an employee of the Chicago Transit Authority, and we met in the WBEZ studios to talk about the Chicago tunnel floods of 1992. We were talking about the, like the, the origins for you. How did you first become interested and curious about tunnels and tunnel technology and all that? Well, it was not so much about tunnel technology, although they're really, it's a really interesting subject. And I like to explore building basements and things like that. Okay, yeah, me too. Things that are underfoot. Yep. And I had... Really, my hobby, really since grade school, was um, local transportation and transportation history. I would Mm -hmm. accumulate photos and subscribe to magazines and even belong to a few groups starting in high school that followed railroad, everything from dispatching and logistics on down. And are you like the kid in the candy store, Bruce? You got the job at the CTA, like I can't believe they pay me to do this. Well, they don't pay me to do anything with tunnels. Okay. My, I've had s- uh, several different jobs at CTA and a little bit at RTA and a bus company. But the CTA job generally has to do with the uh, design of signage, station signs, bus stop signs, all kinds of signs. CTA has a lot of signs. Not yeah. in, nothing to do with advertising or anything like that but the, the physical signs and stations. And, and for our town business, all these acronyms is the Chicago Transit Authority. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it a, actually an authority like the Port Authority of New York? It is an authority. It is not a city department. It was created by the Illinois State Legislature in 1945 oh. as a municipal corporation. Back then, you did not have um, other types of corporate setups that you would now have for these some of these public entities. Yeah. So, so it is set up as a municipal corporation, and it actually has boundaries. And those boundaries are essentially two-thirds of Cook County. Very interesting. Yeah. And so its board is half populated by the mayor and half by the governor. So that's when I want to get that CTA stop from uh, Countryside. i got to drive to Oak Park, to, <laughs> and that's my closest one. Yeah, I, I'm afraid so, although pace goes that way. Yeah. Um, we... Um, I, I don't want to dig too deep in, 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 into the past because the, the tunnel system under Chicago that flooded in a, a, a big incident in the 90s came up in an earlier podcast that, that I had. And I thought, you know, that in and of itself, that system would be a really interesting interview. And all you have to do 
folks is just do some Google searches and Bruce Moffat comes up. And, and I'd seen your book, Bruce, mentioned years ago, I think in Chicago Magazine, 40 Feet Below. And so I actually had it on my Alibris book list. And I thought, I think this is the guy. Rather than talking to a bunch of civil engineers from the yeah. city, yeah. Um, and I see you brought a copy well, of you today. Actually, there are two books. Okay. The first one was the book from 1982. Right. A little soft cover thing, about oh, 90 or so pages. I was starting to, over the years, starting in grade school, high school, starting to accumulate material on the freight tunnel system as I was on the elevated and the streetcars. Mm -hmm. And I did it out of curiosity because uh, in the Sunday papers when they were large, thick things, every once in a while there'd be a nice filler piece about these abandoned freight tunnels under the city. Okay. And it was really intriguing. It's really different. It was a two-foot gauge electric railroad when it was running, So, and it was a very large one. And so I was starting to accumulate information on it. And um, one day, just out of college, the light bulb went off. I thought, hey, Marshall Fields was one of the uh, buildings that was served by the mm -hmm. freight tunnels. Freight tunnel maps were not necessarily that hard to find. And, gee, my dad works at Marshall Fields, <laughs> night supervisor. And so I wonder if their entrance works. Well, long story short, that my first visit into the freight tunnels was through the basement of Marshall Fields. And it was still accessible all those years later yeah. after being closed. After being closed. It was any number of buildings actually were that way because system closed. Some buildings used the tunnel for uh, draft, for you know, furnace draft, okay. for ventilation. Uh, there was no real security concerns. The system was really hard to access in the first place. It was pretty much ignored. Mm -hmm. And the articles in the paper would show like these inspectors checking the tunnels. And it looks like, oh, we dragged someone out of the office for this photo op, which they were usually taken within about two blocks of City Hall, which also yeah. had an entrance. Right. And that's what started the ball rolling on gathering up more information, doing a lot more serious research, even including who built the freight cars and locomotives. Uh, I learned how to research uh, the state and federal commerce commissions for the company's annual reports as railroads. They had to file reports mm -hmm. and they would get into a lot of the mundane accounting, but also locomotives, what they ran, mm -hmm. that type of thing. And it's just sort of Grew out of that and wound up uh, with this book in 1982, which also involved me wearing down an entire city department. Yeah. And I went to work for CTA to get in and explore and do some field checking. Okay. You got to you got to check. And uh, and then after the 1992 loop flood, ten years later, mm -hmm. I did a hardcover book, the Chicago Tunnel Story, which okay. covers a lot more territory. Right because the freight tunnel system actually started as a telephone company in Chicago that just happened to have conduits big enough to run small trains through. It was a private enterprise, and uh, what the promoters needed from the city was a franchise, which is in essence is operating rights, uh, rights to occupy the public way. Mm -hmm. And that would be the same for streetcar lines, electric, gas, telephone, telegraph, anything you had to get a franchise. And all of this was happening in the late 1890s hmm. for the freight tunnel system. It was started by a group of people who were aligned with the automatic electric company. You may have heard of Western Electric, which sure. supplied equipment for the Bell system for years. Automatic Electric was a separate company that had pioneered the use of dial telephones decades before they would become commonplace mm -hmm. on the Bell system. And they we're going to start a telephone operation in Chicago, competing telephone service. And they needed a franchise. And back then, uh, you may have heard of the Gray Wolves. No. The Gray Wolves is a um, euphemism of sorts for s some aldermen who uh, expected uh, 
something in return for their votes. Oh, know? yeah. Oh, Mason, you know, that, that never happens no, today. No, 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 no. <laughs> Graft. Uh, uh, back then, uh, it was a lot more out in front and a lot dirtier than it is today. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the, t- you needed to get enough aldermen to vote for your franchise grant mm-hmm. and the details that went into it. And telephone votes apparently cost less than anything having to do with railroads. And so they promoted it strictly as a telephone operation, even though at some early point in all of this, they decided that they were at least going to go in the direction of also having a small narrow gauge railroad. That's fascinating. It's not full size, but uh, what ultimately wound up was a, was a railroad whose um, freight cars were maybe about the size of station wagons at the biggest. Mm-hmm. It was uh, uh, a two-foot gauge railroad, two feet between the rails instead of what's typical now, which is four feet, eight and a half. So they're mu- much, much smaller. And they, and they just happened – and they had as part of their requirement to put their – wires in well, all of the downtown area and then some underground in conduits, which is okay. You put wires in conduits, pipes. Well, their conduits just have to be a little bigger than most. Uh, They were about six feet wide, seven and a half feet tall. Wow. And uh, when asked about why such big conduits, oh, we have to have room to unroll the reels of cable. Hmm. It's also no surprise that when they started digging in 1899, they started in the basement of a uh, saloon near City Hall that was owned by the first ward alderman. Hmm. They, you know, it, it it's sort of a chicken of the a chicken and the egg thing, with with this railway and cabling for communication. I, I remember being really amazed that Sprint Telephone stood for Southern Pacific Railroad International because they used their right of way mm-hmm. to get their cable out there. Were uh, and to jump way ahead into current day, are these are is this f- old freight tunnel system used for uh, today for uh, for cabling or for uh, fiber or anything else? Yes, that started in the nineteen eighties. Okay, uh, the city was leasing out parts of the abandoned tunnel system, which, by the way, they had legislated ownership to themselves back in the early 30s. Okay. Uh, They leased out to various fiber optic companies for telephone, uh, computer, that type of thing. And they also uh, leased out some sections to Commonwealth Edison for high-voltage conduits. All right. Well, they were they were thinking ahead. Yeah. Uh, it, um, the original, uh, the absolute original purpose. Uh, you mentioned in, um, earlier that some even vented for uh, HVAC purposes. But w- was it was it logistical for the inventory of your Marshall Fields? Was it coal? Was it waste disposal? What what was the what was the the driver economically for this system that they put in. Unlike tunnels and subway systems elsewhere in cities, normally you're putting the passenger trains, the subway trains, you know, underground. Here the idea was to take the freight off the streets. Oh. You were in the horse-drawn days. Uh, horse and wagon delivery type congestion was tremendous in Chicago at the turn of the uh, 19th into the 20th century. Back then, Horse and wagon only uh, was used by three groups of people that could afford it. One was the very rich, Mm -hmm. farmers, and businesses. Okay. So you had a tremendous amount of freight traffic being handled by wagons between uh, the railroads, had their freight terminals all on the edge of the loop because anything moving any appreciable distance was carried by railroad. Not only whole carload lots, but individual packages. Mm -hmm. And so they all had these freight terminals. And so you had all this wagon traffic making the connections to, say, an Eastern Railroads terminal. It's going to be put on a train going to the west. So that's a trip across town by wagon. Or it's deliveries within the city. Delivery comes in. It's going to Marshall Fields or some industrial concern. It had to 
moved by wagon then. So it's our modern, the, uh, the modern equivalent would be cross docking areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you had all this space in between and the idea was we'll get all this freight congestion off the streets and move it underground. A really innovative idea, the, uh, the Teamsters back then, because Teamster actually meant you handled a horse team, mm -hmm. uh, they were not so enthused uh, with that idea. What the uh, company did was they basically built a grid network that mirrored the streets above. They built almost indiscriminately under most downtown streets okay. and then went to try and solicit businesses and buildings to hook into the freight tunnels. And they were at 40 feet below the street, which is basically the depth of the uh, two CTA subways downtown. Uh, still? Right, uh, okay. Right All right. And they were at that particular depth because there's a lot of clay at that elevation and it's easier to tunnel through the clay in terms of construction and, and the uh, support work you have to have up to hold back everything. It's easier to dig. It's, it's physically harder to dig through clay, but it's stable. So if we're conceptualizing this in our mind, you have the CTA system and the the old tunnel system are basically at the same depth, yes. 40 feet. Mm -hmm. they, did they just take over certain better routes for the CTA when the CTA bored its tunnels yeah. the, and then left the others behind? The tunnels were bored uh, by the city. The city owns the state and Dearborn Street subways, and they started digging those in 1939 and opened the first route, State Street, in 1943. When that happened, the Chicago Tunnel Company, which operated the freight tunnel system, lost some of their more profitable trackage. A lot of their major department store connections were, of course, under State Street. Sure. Because Chicago had, oh, six or eight department stores of fairly large size. Yep. Most were connected. And the city did, after some pressure, build a couple of bypass tunnels to connect pieces that were more or less now isolated from the main system okay. when the subway was pushed through. Earlier plans for the subways uh, envisioned the subways to be a little shallower in depth, so they would have been essentially immediately above the freight tunnels. But at the end of the day, that didn't happen. I'm going to just diverge for a second. I remember that uh, when I lived in, in New York, they talked about finding some of the abandoned stations from the old subway system, which I think was higher, correct, closer to the ground, mm -hmm. and the, the more modern subway was lower. And these guys were discovering these vaults of the old system that were stations that were like King Tut's tomb. You know, they were so ornate. Uh, back in the early 1900s, Ornate, that was considered just a normal level of decoration right, right. for a very public place. Right. You would have something attractive. Yeah. And that Imagine was normal. That. And they were not necessarily unknown or forgotten. It's, it's, okay, they're there, but no one cared. So to someone else, it's a discovery. Right. When it's like, oh, well, it's been there all the time. And that was the problem that uh, came back to the city in 1992 when right. the loop flood occurred. With the once this grid started to get developed under State Street, uh, we're talking about the original tunnel system now. What what was the uh, big cash cow? Was it was it the move moving of inventory? Was it the coal? Was it the waste disposal? What was what was the real nuts and bolts of the 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 income piece? Uh, the real nuts and bolts were several commodities: uh, coal. Not only for winter heating, but for hot water. Okay. And also for ventilation in large enough buildings that actually had forced air ventilation, which weren't really that many. Uh, the removal of the cinders oh. that came. Wait. And that also included cinder removal from buildings that got their coal still by wagon because it was you could have basically a gravity system of dumping the cinders into special tunnel cinder cars. Then the tunnel company would take them to their transfer station where it would be uh, either sent by railroad to be dumped in a landfill somewhere or dumped in the lake. And I imagine there were private contractors like there is waste management today that had some nice contracts with the city for disposal and that sort of thing? Well, the tunnel company as a private enterprise, they were 
the city had no involvement in oh. the in the disposal of of commercial waste. And really, I'm not sure they have a whole lot of involvement now. It's usually you're individually dealing with private companies, okay. and the tunnel company solicited these buildings. Hey, we'll cart away your cinders for, of course, X dollars, and then we'll hand them off to a landfill operator, or they'll get dumped in the lake by right. an operator that does that, and that's right. what they did. The last major uh, commodity was general merchandise, packages, crates, anything that was small enough to move through the tunnels, which would be probably no larger than a um, like a couch if you want it in terms of bulk. Sure. It was mainly small packages back. Then almost everything was packaged in, in wooden boxes or crates, right. batteries, uh, tooling. Uh, they handled uh, some processed uh, uh, goods like uh, I know they did some candy in later years that was received over at the Merchandise Mart and was shipped through the tunnel to go to one railroad or another for shipment. And retail. It's not but, that different from what Amazon attempts to accomplish today. Really? No, there's actually a, a, a tremendous amount of parallels. And what really limited the system was the cost to expand, which was tremendous, and really uh, they could not afford it. The system was never really truly profitable. It had its good years, but on the whole, it just did not work out, especially as the city spread out. Uh, Railroads, certainly after World War II, were getting out of the small package business. They were losing that to trucks. Motor mm -hmm. trucks uh, were getting ever better. Businesses were locating farther out. The tunnel company did try and compete with local trucking. They started their own trucking company, which was around for quite a few years, called Chicago Tunnel Transport. Hmm. But they were considered a, a cartage company, and cartage companies are generally metro areas, what right. they handle. They don't handle interstate generally. No, well, what we in real estate would call that termination point. You mentioned the alderman had, uh, it was a bar, a basement of a bar that actually got a, a tun tunnel hookup. Well, that's where they started their construction was in the basement. It didn't have a hookup for commodities because it was actually a, a rather small, confining little tunnel you would build just for workmen to crawl through. Okay. And the next north-south street was LaSalle, and then they that's where they started digging the larger tunnel. And they okay. added other construction shafts elsewhere around the loop, and they were generally uh, in sidewalk areas. They would build a, a wooden building with an elevator to bring up the spoil, which would be the excavated clay, dirt, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And then they would dump it into wagons. And later they also used some of their own trains for this, and that material went to help fill in what is today Grant Park. Oh. So if I'm if I'm uh Marshall Fields and I want I wanted a hook up to this system that was there, mm -hmm. um I wish you know they would I, we would you know, hire a commercial real estate broker to do that today, but I uh, it how how would I have gotten into the system? Did I have to pay to be hooked into this system? What what was the procedure and who got the points? Originally, it appears that the company, the Chicago Tunnel Company, under its earlier names, paid that. However, that became very expensive very fast. So at a certain point, and we're, we're talking all before about 1906, mm -hmm. they uh, started uh, charging buildings okay. for this. For buildings like fields, well, Certainly they could afford it, but also Fields had a deep enough building. The building on State Street has three basements. Okay. And the, first, and the bottom most level met the tunnel, and, and Fields had at least three separate track entrances into that building. Goodness. They could run their merchandise trains in one end and out the other. Other buildings uh, would have uh, elevators to raise the freight cars up to their basement levels because they just weren't deep enough. Mm -hmm. Or they would have maybe a conveyor if they were just receiving coal and an ash chute for ash. Mm -hmm. It depended. 
the problem was uh, certainly elevator connections um, to buildings that weren't deep enough were really expensive. So you had to have a lot of traffic to justify it. And mm-hmm. it meant that a lot of buildings simply did not connect mm-hmm. because of that, because you could have a wagon pull up to your door for nothing. So did Marshall Fields sell access to their basement to other close-by buildings? Do you have any idea? No no idea. Yeah. They also had another building for where their own warehousing, in the southwest edge of downtown, which I believe was connected as okay. well. You probably know about this being a, a tunnel expert. When I've uh, been on tours of office buildings, I'm, I'm told about that ice-based AC system that runs underground from the Merchandise Mart and a few other connected buildings, even, I believe, under the Chicago River. is Was that part and parcel of the same system? Did it, was it earlier, later? What was the... That's, that's totally separate. Okay. And Edison had set up a subsidiary, which I believe has been separated into its own now, which also has several ice plants. Okay. But no, the, the tunnel system leased out parts of their network, little pieces, yes. for steam heat and even did try and sell steam heat commercially under the name Chicago Steam Corporation. Wow. And they were under a, uh, they had in a couple of tunnels that they really didn't use, but it didn't really catch on like it's caught on in New York and even Oak Park for years had a uh, steam heating system Incredible. such that when it finally went out of business, a lot of homeowners had to go out and buy furnaces because they'd been hooked up to a commercial steam heating company. Fascinating. And uh, the um, you mentioned that the companies that would build these wood superstructures while they dug out the, the tunnel area, then take it over to, to infill Grant Park. Was that all was that all public project works or was there a you know was there a, a, a Great Lakes Dredge, I think is that the name of that company? Was it a private company partnership, do you know? The tunnel spoil was basically given to the city as a public service. It was given for free because it relieved them of having to pay to have it dumped and transported elsewhere. So it was like, here, have it. It also created, of course, a little goodwill with the city. Sure. And they, uh, the company, and, went, and they were very much under construction in 1902. 20304. One of the things they did early on was one of the tunnels they built included ramps up into what would become Grant Park, known as Lakefront Park, and it around Congress, mm-hmm. Harrison and Michigan, which at that point was little more than water east of the tracks that now are used by Metra. Okay. And uh, the tunnel ramped up, it came out of the ground, and Across the railroad, and then they built a trestle, and they would bring in trains loaded with spoil, and then spread it around in the park area. And they weren't the only ones filling in the park. The city had others, and it was a, a place where a lot of construction spoil was dumped to mm-hmm. make the park. And they were. That was a huge job because you didn't have bulldozers and things like that back then. So you were using horse-drawn teams and steam-powered cranes Mm -hmm. to dump containers of spoil and then spread it out. I look at this a little bit, uh, this authority that's created, this, this, this governmental system that's created, and think that somehow they missed an economic opportunity that a Robert Moses in New York did not miss with with the Port Authority and with the bridges, the Triborough Bridge. Um, But that's just the broker in me talking. What economically and in terms of heavy traffic and usage and utility was the absolute apex and high point of the system? What year was that? What years were those? And and, and what, what was working and clicking along so perfectly? About 1929 would have been the apex in terms of uh, what they had in the case of locomotives and cars and the number in service, which is a good indicator of of business. They had 149 electric locomotives in those two years, which is an absolutely huge number. Even though they're very small, uh, maybe 10 feet, 12 feet long, they're 
It's still a lot of electric locomotives that weighed about six tons. That's a, a lot later than I would have thought you would have said. It, it, late 20s. Yeah, it built over a period of time. And about 1929 is when you had the Civic Opera House coming online. And that was one of the last big buildings to be attached to the freight tunnels. The absolute last building, but as far as I know, never did get any uh, use of it, was the Prudential Building, I understand, actually had a connection when it was built. Oh, we do um, Because the tunnels passed under it that used to be partly an Illinois Central Railroad freight yard, and they had freight houses. And so there was a, a connection of some sort there, but it was never used. So um, it, it, just so we can think of your numbers, you mentioned the number of cars that were there. If... Elon Musk's tunnel system does connect the loop to O'Hare. What kind of volume at maximum capacity that they're talking about would be comparative here to 1929? Well, you're talking really apples and oranges in terms of passengers versus carload freight or very tiny carloads of freight. Uh, the freight tunnel system had over 3,200 freight cars. And they had at their peak about 61 miles of track in tunnel. Oh. There was also track in in larger buildings, had it in basements, could even have it on multiple levels of the building uh, with elevators connecting them. There was a marvelous building that's now gone on the west bank of the Chicago River at uh, Dearborn Street that had a four-track layout in its basement and elevators to take the cars up. It was a... a a wholesale grocery company hmm. that was had that. They also had a railroad siding behind them, and they had a dock in front, a Steel Wheels Company, and they uh, they were a big operation. Uh, Musk is talking about actually using fairly low capacity vehicles to transport riders to okay. O'Hare. If the apex of the system was 1929. You don't have to be much of a student of American history to know that this system was up and running at its best operational time during Prohibition. And you have a guy that's hooked it up to a saloon. Were there Was there constant illegal use of this tunnel system that was overlooked, bribed, turned aside? We had quite a, a long... Um, podcast section on the breweries in Milwaukee and the ice houses that were used prior to Prohibition that got reused and and just paid off so that they could be a little way stations for, for the Capone gang. Okay. But what about this? The uh, tavern connection uh, downtown had long since ceased to be there. I mean, it was – tavern was gone – that was blocked off. No evidence of any illegal use like that. As a matter of fact, a long time ago, you may remember the infamous Geraldo Rivera special. Oh, yeah, where he went into Al Capone's vault. vault. Yeah. And they called me. And that location was down around Cermak and Michigan Avenue. And I, they asked me about that type of thing. Could Al have used it to make a getaway? And I said, no, starting with it doesn't come anywhere near your building. <laughs> if, you, if Al is going to have a tunnel, he's going to be going into the building next door, the building across the street. Tunneling is difficult, expensive, and sometimes can be rather obvious to the neighbors. <laughs> you know, when you're di- hauling out all this spoil, that can be hard. Yeah. The nearest f- freight tunnel connection was probably about three quarters of a mile away. And at 40 feet down, that is a really tough mining job to yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. But this system actually, it it ran pretty cleanly as far as you as know. As far as you know, it, there may have been alcohol that went through, but I mean, it would have been crated and boxed like any other commodity. So in that regard, you know, who's who's to tell? But you know, you're not going to actually go out of your way to enlist the company and give them this knowledge. You are just going to be shipping your product that is crated, right? And you're going to be delivering it to that railroad or that truck line because they had connections with every railroad in town mm-hmm. for transfer of freight. And they had four or five 
uh, receiving stations to handle to and from motor trucks plus barges. So could something have traveled by tunnel? Sure. We'll have no knowledge, though. Right. And, of course, liquor was flowing all kinds of ways. Right. So yeah, it, you, you hear today that the, the, the United States Postal Service actually delivers more drugs than anybody else. Yes. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know if that's urban legend or what. what. What year did they decide to close this system down? Lock, stock, and barrel. We're turning the key. This isn't going to get used anymore. It went by degrees because certainly from the Depression on, it was not making money. For a long time, it was owned by various railroads. It was a stock-held company, and they kept it going for whatever reason. Part of it may have been regulatory problems. The regulatory environment in Illinois and federally made abandoning of railroads difficult. Okay. Today, you can do it with actually a lot less fuss than what was required back then. But they kept going. And it, they sold the company in the early 1950s to a guy who owned the Morrison Hotel, which in local lore was somewhat of an interesting hotel, the world's tallest hotel. Hmm. Uh, it wasn't necessarily that big, but it was near City Hall. And this this guy was a bit of an operator, and he he thought he could make the tunnels pay. And he got the post office to try and route mail through it. The company had done that in the really early years, but it wasn't very profitable. And then that didn't work. He tried some other things. That didn't work. He bailed out. And the, the company lost business steadily as buildings converted from coal to gas for heating, mm -hmm. which also meant no cinders to remove. Trucks were making a big inroad as they got better and the roads got better. And uh, shipping on the Great Lakes was disappearing bit by bit, as was... As I mentioned earlier, the railroads getting out of the small package business, you know, when people like UPS then came along, FedEx is much, much later. So it's sort of dying it, the slow death. Was there an official decision to, you know what, this can't get maintained yeah. anymore and we're just going to close it lock, stock, and they, barrel? They, they would retrench. There really wasn't much to do when you did that because it's a tunnel. It's not like you're going to rip up the track and fill it in. You just leave it. Right. Then came the beginning of 1959, and they were down to their last couple of customers for ash removal. Okay. And they ran out of money and credit. The Chicago Northwestern Railroad, which at that point was receiving the cinders for disposal – in Wisconsin, cut them off, saying we're not handling anything more because you can't pay the bill. Okay. And it, it ended that way. This is your host, John Hunter. If you, your company, or your organization would like to sponsor our real estate episodes, you can have an internal advertisement placed in the podcast. Please contact me at john at jhunterservices.com. Stages to Success can be found on TuneIn Radio, Google Play, iTunes, or our RSS feed. The link can be found at www.stagestosuccesspodcast.com. Try telling your Amazon Echo to play it by commanding Play Stages to Success Podcast. We're speaking today with Bruce Moffat, author of a couple books about the Great Tunnel Flood of 1992, and a precursor to that 40 feet below that described the freight tunnel system of the city of Chicago. Bruce is a lifelong enthusiast, a hobbyist, and arguably the greatest expert on this topic that I could possibly imagine to bring to stages to success. Did they have to secure these entrances so that, you know, bums can't go down there and sleep and uh, uh, it can't be used for other purposes. Uh, what, what, did they did they secure anything? Well, all the buildings, all the entrances to the system were through buildings. Okay, several stories down. So the first line of security rests with the buildings because you, if you're a building owner, you don't want unauthorized people in your lower levels to begin with. And it just became, oh, there's the tunnel. No one used it certainly to live in because, well, it 
really hard to get to, and actually it really isn't very pleasant in there at mm-hmm. the end of the day. It's rather cool in most places. Some places have surface water. There are other areas that have a lot of water simply because of seepage. Mm-hmm. And it was just this artifact, and since getting into it was so hard, no one really worried, and it just quietly receded from the consciousness. I mean, the city knew they had the tunnels, but it's sort of an afterthought. It's like a lot of abandoned infrastructure. Oh, it's it's there. And right. back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, you didn't have half the problems you have today with vandalism and, and trespassing mm-hmm. that you have today, at least the type that rises to the level of even police action. Do people call Bruce Moffat and say, we want a secret tour for our spelunking society mm-hmm. and take us through these places? He can't get in the tunnels easily. <laughs> the city, after the loop flood really clamped down, and they did some things that probably should have been done a lot earlier, um, like put in some watertight doors at the river crossings, Mm -hmm. because at the time of the loop flood, they did not have any watertight doors at the river crossings, of which there were about eight or nine that were still in place. And there was no high water alarm. There really wasn't much other than a few small pumps that kept one or two of the river crossings more or less clear so they could walk and and be checked. That was it. When the loop flood happened on April 13, 1992, their high water alarm was the building engineer at the merchandise mart saying he's getting water. That's what I heard. I was wondering if that was really true. That was really true, and I worked at the mart, and I was sitting in the lobby. Uh, It was, I was, coming into work. I was early. So I sat in the lobby for a little while and I could hear the security guards radios just going like crazy. Normally they're pretty quiet. And I went upstairs and we didn't have a radio or anything up there. And, and this was before you'd have computers in the office or the mainframe. So there was, you could go look at the net because it wasn't there, there yet. There was no internet, right? And, and they let us go home. And then I turned on the news and they're talking about all these buildings that are getting water in them and they don't know where it's coming from. And they listed some of the buildings. And I noticed, oh, they're all older buildings, mm-hmm. 1930s, 20s or earlier. Yeah. And I said, I know where it's coming from. It's coming from the tunnels. Mm-hmm. It's the only place. They all had a connection. Now you uh, – so basically, basically there really was no long-term maintenance plan once they closed this system. No, they, it just was left. It was left. The company walked away. We're gone. This city had already claimed ownership of anything under the public way, which was 99 percent of it. And their maintenance consisted of someone going down every once in a while and looking uh, and doing maybe a little minor pumping. They really didn't do any maintenance, yeah, like an old basement in an abandoned building or something. Yeah, they just they just left it. So you know, but ten years before this debacle happened, you wrote forty feet below. Did it, did you write any like prophecy in there that you could say, oh, oh you better, you know? No, I be, I did the book as a straight railroad history because I was documenting based on what I had at the time, the company and what they did, and then in the years after that little book. It sold, it sold uh, steadily as a railroad book. Uh, uh-huh. Over 10 years, it sold 5,000 copies, which for a railroad book is really good. Yeah. And then came the loop flood. <clears throat> and on the day of the loop flood, the book went out of print. And reporters all over were trying to get their hands on a copy because once you've gone to the flood site and reported on the buildings and all this disruption, now you need background information. Sure. And I had inadvertently cornered the market on background information. And I didn't have two copies to rub together. Wow. And so it was suddenly being bootlegged uh, thanks to copying machines because that's all I could do. And, And my employer was doing a lot of that copying. It's like I couldn't be upset. I called the publisher who was in Los Angeles and they were having problems because their printing plant was in South Central LA and they were having riots. And I said, I need books. It took about a month to get books, but I sold 5,000 more. Okay. After that. So it wasn't the worst thing. You don't get rich, believe me, on railroad books. You know. But that's uh, what happened. And then you fast forward another 10 years and I put out a hardcover version because by that point I didn't gotten a lot more data. Also, I added a large chapter on the flood 
and what happened and all the news reports and what came out of that. So you're saying the actual first report was from a, a building engineer or maintenance person in the mart, yes. saying this. So that that that's our uh, that's our uh, what is the bird in the mines that they use? Oh, the canary. The canary. That's the canary in the mine. Yeah. What about the project ex- itself to drive these pylons into the Chicago River by the Dredge and Dock Company? W- was there any? consideration whatsoever of the fact that there was subterranean tunnels that access this bottom of the river? Well, these wood piles exist around every bridge to prevent craft from running into the bridge okay. and damaging it. And Great Lakes Dredge and Dock had a contract to replace the ones at Kinsey Street. What I don't know is the story behind their request to put the new pilings in a slightly different location for logistical reasons. That's what the paper said, logistical reasons. Now, that may have been nothing more than the fact that maybe they were encountering problems trying to pull out the old piles, and the new piles were installed immediately to the south. The problem at that bridge is, unlike some of the others, the freight tunnel doesn't run under the center line of the bridge. Had it done that, there would have been no problem. This tunnel took a dog leg around the bridge house and was actually just south of the bridge, crossing the river. Mm-hmm. And so when they sunk the new piles in, they separated the wall of the freight tunnel beneath. It pushed an older pile through the side of the wall. Mm. And that started spreading it apart. The contractors are supposed to do a survey and make sure that they know where all things are underground. The city provides drawings, but apparently in this case didn't go out of their way to warn Great Lakes about that. And I don't know how much serious surveying or testing they did to try and locate the tunnel. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, to get into it there back then... You know, the closest place probably would have been the Mart, but it would have been a walk through a lot of standing water to get to the spot even before the flood because some parts are wetter than others even back then. And they just, um, like I said, they, they put in the pilings. It shoved an old piling through the side wall of the tunnel, and over a period of time, the, the wall just separated more and more, and the river bottom silt, started oozing through the wall and into the freight tunnel. And that's when a cable uh, television survey crew, which was looking for a place to put cabling through, found it, and they reported to the city. And uh, So there, there's, there's obviously a point of no return that happened April 13th. Yeah. Is that, is that the, the day the Titanic sunk? I don't know that. I don't know. It was in April. I know, uh, but it was two days before tax day. That's yeah. for sure. Uh, obviously, the point of re- no return is past then. Do we know in, in in arrears? Do we know when that 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 project first punctured the wall of that tunnel under the river? I mean, how long how long was this going on? It A week? Two weeks? It would have. Uh, uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but it would have been more like in January, February, more like probably February of 1992. So months, months. This, this was starting to cascade. Yes. And, and the, the city responded to the complaint. They, it was a comedy of errors in a way. They sent someone to look and the papers wrote up, well, they got there and they couldn't find parking. So they left. Came back another time. I guess they found their parking. They went down. They found, yep, there's a problem here. And then they do what you usually do is you, okay, you get some pictures. You're going to go out for bids, that type of thing. And for a lot of infrastructure, that's usually good enough. But the poor wall couldn't wait. Yeah, you got you, you got uh, an entire river uh, yeah. waiting on the other side. Yeah. 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 Was there a fall guy for this? Uh, uh, there was a, a fall guy. There probably should have been other fall guys. Uh-huh. Uh, there were actually two. Um, Jim McTighe was the uh, city inspector who went and looked at it. 
and took some pictures and then took the pictures to OSCO to be developed. You didn't have digital cameras or downloads back then. You right. took a picture of the drugstore or maybe you had your own service. And the um, so he 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 was a fall guy because he found it and you know could be blamed for not maybe moving fast enough. Mm-hmm. And, but then you're going to go off for a bit. That's going to take a long time. The acting commissioner of transportation he was forced out. He was a nice he was a nice guy. He he was a a good professional engineer. Um, there should have been maybe some higher ups that should have gone to, but uh, that didn't happen. Was it insured? Well. No, not really. I mean, the city has its own liability limits. But what happened with the lawsuits and the damage, because buildings were out of commission for weeks and months, a lot of lost merchandise, ruined equipment, right. all of that, a lot of it was they wound up being able to try it under admiralty law, which is a completely different realm than something that's just a land-based loss. Amazing. And as a result, uh, few, if any, people got any meaningful restitution. The CTA uh, closed its two subways because they were springing leaks. Uh, The CTA pumps were well ahead of the problem, but they didn't want to try and run passenger trains through just in case something went because the subways bisected dozens of these tunnels but they were not built to be truly watertight. Structurally, they're very good, but they weren't designed necessarily for the river pressing in. Right. CTA had this huge bus shuttle that mm. ran from there to the loop and to the west side. I used to take that shuttle in the morning to get to work because I usually took that L route. And you'd come up the stairs at Division and you could see three blocks worth of buses waiting. Every change of the traffic light, another three buses headed downtown Wow! and, and did that because the trains could only make it to division. That's a subway station, but it was higher than all the others. It, 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 it recreated history of why that 40-foot tunnel was created in the first place. Yeah, that's to, the, to avoid the congestion on the streets. Yeah, avoid the congestion. And, you know, it, it points out the dangers of um, either forgetting about abandoned infrastructure or not caring about it. Because just because it's abandoned and out of the way doesn't mean it doesn't have care and maintenance issues that have to be addressed. And I should mention that the freight tunnels are actually remarkable in terms of their construction. They're horseshoe-shaped, and as I mentioned, about seven and a half feet high, a bit over six feet wide. The walls are about 14 inches of concrete without an inch of steel rebar in them. Wow. It's, It's strictly... The horseshoe shape and the clay it sits in that holds the whole thing together. Interesting. It's like my, the Mendota Bridge where I grew up was the longest concrete arch structure as I, I, when I uh, – and but was this sort of like – me as a little kid, we used, to, we used to take a garden hose and we would flood the, the big snake holes or the gopher holes and then the whole thing would collapse. Is that what happened here? Was, did the water going through just – collapse this whole tunnel no. system? No, the tunnels came out of it in very good shape. Amazing. Well, the the water is filling them up and the water is trying to seek its level. So you didn't really have a extreme pressure problem because there's always a, you know, a certain amount of re- release. You know? Yep. And where did it go? It filled a lot of basements and it was gradually pumped out by Kenny Construction was hired to do that. And they uh, they gradually brought down the level because they weren't sure structurally how things would be. Mm-hmm. So it, they they spent a couple of weeks doing it. Uh, they came out very well. So in hindsight, they could have gone faster. Uh, during the flood, the Water Reclamation District or Sanitary District did propose actually uh, connecting the flooded tunnels to the deep tunnel system. I, that's what was going to be my next question. Was the deep tunnel a reaction to this? No, it sounds no. like the deep tunnel already existed. The deep tunnel existed and existed for a totally different reason. It was to uh, control flooding in basements due to sewer backups and water backups mm-hmm. when because of flooding. And it goes to that southwestern suburbs. I think it's a 10 billion gallon tank. 
Yes, and they also have the former Thornton Quarry in the south suburbs. Right. So they, 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 were they prevailed upon? Hey, here's some excess water. Get it, help, help us get it out, MW. I'm, I'm not sure what happened because they were on TV. They actually were on the same, I believe the same installment of Chicago Tonight I was that night about the tunnel. But then you didn't hear anything about them after that. So I'm not sure who was told what. But you didn't hear anything more out of the uh, district. Did the um, did the system that took this water actually completely damage or destroy any buildings whose foundations couldn't handle this? Did any were any buildings just sunk into the ground? Or no, it's amazing, really. No. Well, buildings have very substantial foundations and. You have quite a bit of water in that clay to begin with. There were problems when the tunnels were originally dug with what's called subsidence. But the what is subsidence? Subsidence is when you're tunneling. You're actually if the ground starts moving adjacent to you because of that. That sounds you know, it's like a just bad trying thing. to move. It's in mining. It's a really big problem, <laughs> yeah. especially in Pennsylvania. That's, but that's it. Yeah. So, you know, if you were the Hollywood expert brought in to make the movie about the 1992 Chicago f- tunnel flood disaster, uh, what was the most dramatic thing? It wasn't uh, dramatic. There was a water um, in a portion of the pedway that connects uh, the uh, Thompson Center with City Hall, just a little bit, surface water. Yep. And you had those types of, uh, you had water coming into the expressway in Hubbard's Cave because uh, the roadway in Hubbard's Cave uh, is just below river level. Oh. And that's a pretty good disaster movie thing. Yeah. So they had water from the tunnels seeping up into Hubbard's Cave. It was never to the point where you couldn't drive through it. Oh, but it was just, it was just bad. I feel creepy. Who yeah. was the mayor? Was it Jane Byrne the mayor then? No, it was at Richie Daly. It was Rich Daly. He was fairly new in it, and it was either that year or the next year. The Michigan Avenue Bridge, one of its leaves, sprung upright in a matter of seconds. They were doing counterweight repairs, okay. and the bridge got away from them. So it was not a, uh, a a good time. So the most dramatic thing might have been that his really nice shoes could have get ruined on that walk through the pedway. That might have been the big drama. There yeah, were... but I mean, a huge, huge embarrassment. And so that's why there's a chapter in the Chicago Tunnel story that's rather large to cover all these things. Actually, the most interesting thing that probably happened down there was actually a totally f- uh, fiction was it served as the background for a radio drama where a dinosaur oh. had been woken up when they were blasting for a new section of tunnel, and, of course, it's running around eating people. That's excellent. Yeah. That, that, that would make for... Yeah. That's sort of like the Godzilla movies after the atomic age in yeah. Japan, I, yes. I think. There's um, a movie Union Station with William Holden, old movie where they built sort of an oversized replica of the tunnel with larger cars, and they have a, a hostage, and a oh. gangland-type story going on. But uh, And the Blues Brothers actually built a recreation of a piece that's uh, used in that film where Carrie Fisher has a submachine gun, and she's going to take out Jake Blues. Okay. And they, they I were, remember that. And the tunnel is actually very convincing. It, it There's only a few things that tip you off that it's— not right, besides the fact the city wouldn't let them in. Yeah. But that's pretty now the, much it. That's amazing to me. You know, the city with their on-location film fees that you see all over the place from Batman, now that's a revenue stream that, that yeah. got missed, yeah, for it's, sure. It's, it's, uh, shooting down there is actually hard due to the confines, but uh, the city has made it extremely difficult to get in there. Uh, you'd have to be a bona fide contractor doing <clears throat> approved bona fide work. Yeah. And uh, the buildings that still have entrances do have watertight doors that are alarmed. And 
there are big signs next to those doors that you have to contact so-and-so before you open this door. And so because the city wants you to stay on your side of the property line, and it also avoids the problem of maybe someone getting in there and getting trapped yeah. when the door closes. Because when the flood happened, fortunately, there was nobody in the tunnels for any reason because – they probably would not have made it out because there is no phone. Radio does not work down there. If your flashlight go out or you get hurt, uh, you could surely die. Mm-hmm. It, it really is a – it's urban spelunking or cave exploration with all the hazards that go into a cave that's not been retrofitted for tourists. There, yeah. You have all the track, but there are also holes that may be masked by surface water where there had been a, an intake for a sump pump or for the uh, machinery for moving the track switches. And I fell in a few holes. After a while, you figured out where most of them are because they, they would be in a discernible pattern. But it was uh, – we were – when we would do the explorations, which uh, the city did aid and abet us on many of them, uh, we were always at the very least in pairs. We had a plan, a walking plan – yeah. Extra flashlights, all of that. For a, an electric uh, rail fans club, we even actually ran some carefully choreographed tours one year mm-hmm. before the – well, it was actually after the flood but before the city clamped down. And those involved any number of logistical meetings, agreements with the city law department. It it was really carefully done mm-hmm. because it is it, – it really is a hazardous place. Speaking of commercial real estate, one building that was not connected but did get water was Sears Tower. Interesting. And that's because when the tower was excavated, they bisected a tunnel which actually ran through the middle of the site. So that went away Mm -hmm. and they put in their building. And like the subways, it was not designed to be truly watertight because you're not expecting this wall of water. Yeah. The, the bulkheads that had been installed there and at various other places over the years were simply to wall off a problem or where you had, you know, you had ended the tunnel for some construction. They were not meant for anything stronger than that. Interesting. And is it, um, I, 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 I guess I'll just think of the, the obvious uh, down the road issue, which is the, the the Patriot Act for our leases for acts of terrorism. Has that ever been discussed? You know, this gives access to, you know, points X, Y, and Z, or is it just so secured and bifurcated that there's no way it could be used for the wrong, by the wrong people? You know, the fire department and the city department of transportation, which has Responsibility. I mean, they have their maps. They have their securement plans. The tunnels are so deep and so small, and with all that clay around them, mm-hmm. I probably what had happened in an explosion is going to send the explosion down the tunnel. It's not going to be able to actually move anything <laughs> above so. it because yeah. you're 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 so deep. You're just too deep. Yeah, it, it's not practical. Not practical use for a lot of things because they frankly are too small. Bruce Moffat, to the idea that uh, a hobbyist that works for the, Sh- the Chicago Transportation Authority is the expert is something I just love. I Because lo- they couldn't pay you enough to in your job to do the kind of uh, study that a person does from their heart well, and I, really I did, loves it. I did it for the challenge. Yeah. The research challenge. You get interested in something and you go after it. And this was before research was synonymous with I will Google this. Right. I, being a rail enthusiast and belonging to clubs, I had developed various friendships with people who had years ago figured out, oh, you're going to research down at Springfield? You got to go here, here, here and look for this. Or this particular reference library has this in dead storage kind of a thing. Right. And you would work that. And it, they developed into books that I did because – of the challenge and the interest, and I learned a lot in the process. And are, is is it still available? I mean, now we have Amazon. So are your books still available? 
They're both out of print, but they do pop up from time to time. On a Libris or Amazon. Or or eBay. You'll find them usually on eBay. Chicago Tunnel Story is is going to be the best and most comprehensive. It could have been disastrous, but for on the front end, being well-engineered, as you said. Yes, and no one got injured, hurt, killed, or anything. And it was the flood that you didn't see other than all these hoses running out of buildings. Yeah. So it was a very strange uh, flood. Yeah. Well, Bruce, thank you so much for coming into uh, WBEZ Studios today. I thank you for your time, and I I hope you get more inquiries and speaking engagements galore as we air this episode next month. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Bruce Moffat, an employee of the Chicago Transit Authority, but much more importantly, probably the greatest expert in the world on the Chicago freight tunnel system. Bruce is an avid hobbyist, discoverer, and researcher, and author on this topic. I'm your host, John Hunter, digital editing and technical assistance from Monty Scott, and recorded at the studios of Chicago Public Media at Navy Pier. Join us again for people and stories from the worlds of the symphony orchestra and commercial real estate for our next episode of Stages to Success. To Success. To Success. To Success. To Success. success.